our life is a collection of systems and processes. Everything is a system or a process, even the towel hanging after you take a shower, the towel hanging on the towel rack mm. in the bathroom is a system because mm. of osmosis. And over time, the towel dries. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? It's Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co-host, Mr. David Green. I got no good nickname for today. That's okay. We're What's gonna up, call man? you Brandon Throwing Bows Turner because you just smashed <laughs> your microphone with your elbow. I did. Ow, that hurts. I like hit the funny bone right there. Uh anyway, speaking of funny bone, uh let's get to today's quick, quick tip. tip. I have no way to pull in funny bone into today's quick tip, but I'm going to give the quick tip anyway. Uh, so today's quick tip uh, is related to what we're talking about today. So today we're interviewing an author of a great book called Work the System. His name is Sam Carpenter. It's kind of a different show where the first half we interview Sam. The second half, we bring in an, one of uh, Sam's partners named Josh. And Josh is kind of the implementer or integrator of Sam's business that that helps people systematize their business. So uh Anyway, in the show, we talk a lot about systems and processes. So here's my quick tip for everyone. This is something my buddy Tarl Yarber actually made me do recently. Uh, and I did it and it was really, really eye-opening. Go and grab a piece of paper. And for the next like 10 minutes, write, set a timer for 10 minutes and write down every single solitary thing that you do in your business. Everything you do, right? Like in your real estate business, let's say. You know, analyze a rental property, uh, make the offer and get specific if you can. Like, you know, you should have a list of, I don't know, 20, 30, 50. I don't know. It depends on how busy you are. Uh, everything that you should do in or like, you you know, basically you currently do in your business. Then go ahead and put a little star next to everything that only you can ever do, that you're the only person on this planet that could ever do that role. You shouldn't have a lot of stars. You maybe not have any. Uh, and then... Uh, I guess just doing that practice we can go on and on about there's like more steps to this thing, but that's basically the gist is it's to help realize these are the systems you need to build. The reason I suggest doing that is because everything we talk about today is going to be about systems. So that is today is not so quick tip. Yeah. And I'm doing this myself. It's a a good practice. So I'm, I'm hiring right now. I thought today's episode was awesome for me because I'm trying to hire loan officers. I'm hiring real estate agents. I'm hiring administrators and a lot of what is talked about, is exactly what I'm going through. Being forced to systemize what you're trying to do, being forced to give clear direction to the people you hire. And then he mentioned several times, if you have a person that can't think for themselves, that needs you to tell them like inhale, exhale type stuff, then you don't have an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a really good point too. A lot of business owners beat themselves up because they're not good at hiring, but you can't control everything with just hiring, right? The employees that you hire and the partners that you hire have to perform as well. So there's a ton of really good stuff in here if you're trying to build a business, run a business, or turn your real estate investing world into a business. Yeah. Yeah. So again, like I said, today's guest is Sam Carpenter. So I got recommended this book back over a decade ago. I bought it, uh, the first edition of the book. In fact, I actually got it at Goodwill. I was just looking at it today. And when I moved to Hawaii three years ago, I got rid of 90% of my books. I just kept the ones that were most important to me. And this is one of them that came with me. So Work the System by Sam Carpenter is phenomenal. And you're going to hear more about that today. All right. With that said, I think it's time to bring in Sam. And then again, about halfway through the show, we're going to uh, switch and bring in in Josh. So you'll hear from both of them today. And with that said, let's get into it. Mr. Sam Carpenter, welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast, man. It's awesome to have you here. Hey, Brandon, David, thank you so much. Fun. Yeah. Yeah, dude, I'm, I'm excited. We, you know, got to know you a little bit here in the, the past few minutes, just uh, right before we hit the record button. And I was uh, showing off my, my early copy of Work the System, which you told me never to show anybody ever. So, you know, nobody <laughs> ever is uh, going to remember that. <laughs> It's in the fourth. It's in the fourth edition now. You have a first edition. Yes, I I have been a old. I've been a work the system nut for for many years now, and so this is a huge honor to be able to get you on the show and talk about it. But thank you. I want to start. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, man. Yeah, I want I want to start at the very beginning though for people who haven't heard your story before. Uh, like, who are you, and um, what were you before? the system or a systems guy? Well, uh, I'll really nutshell this for you. I, uh, 
I'm from upstate New York, moved to Oregon in my early 20s, uh, did some random jobs, forest service, surveying, forestry kind of things. And then uh, uh, I worked for electric utility and I moved to Bend, Oregon in uh, uh, 1978. And then I realized I couldn't work in a corporate structure. And like a lot of your followers, there's a lot of people out there who know they need to work for themselves, right? And so uh, I worked for, I was a project engineer for an electric utility for about 10 years altogether. And then uh, I realized I couldn't do this corporate thing. And so I bought a small business. It's a call center answering service. I had seven employees, uh, $5,000 a month of gross revenue. And uh, what happened was it turned into a nightmare. I went into hundred hour work weeks. It's very technical. You have all the employee problems and, and so forth. A long story short, very, very long story short, I went 15 years, that's a decade and a half, 100-hour work weeks, no family, I got into a divorce, got custody of my kids, and mm. uh, had health problems. And at, at year 15 into the business, when I was 50 years old, and that was that was uh, 1999, I'm an old guy now, uh, <laughs> I realized I stumbled across uh a concept that I applied to the business and everything in my life changed. And so it had to do with the work, the system principles, which you know about Brandon. And, and uh, I applied these and, and essentially what it is, is our life is a collection of systems and processes. Everything is a system or a process, even the towel hanging after you take a shower, the towel hanging on the towel rack mm. in the bathroom is a system because mm. of osmosis. And over time, the towel dries or building a car or driving a car or running a business or running a real estate effort. Uh, and so I applied these principles and I call it one layer deeper, which is my new book that's coming out. Uh, and you go one layer deeper and you look at the mechanical principles of how life works on planet earth. And uh, you realize everything does happen across uh, continuing of this thing we all share called time. And so you mm. got to get the sequence right and you got to be headed in the right direction. And so that's what I've done. And now we talked briefly before uh, Diana and I live in a beautiful rural area of Kentucky. We sold our house in Bend, Oregon uh, in our commercial building there. And we live the life. I work maybe two hours a month and my income is well, it's well into the one percent. And I, I work maybe a couple hours a month on it. R&D and big decisions and so forth. We have no debt personally, or in the business, the call center, I still own now 37 years later, but that's a real, wow. that's a real, uh, thumbnail. And, and one thing I want to say quickly here is I'm a climber. I like mountain climbing and I like riding bicycles, but a lot of people would take their, uh, their passion and want to do that for a job. And that's the worst thing you can do because you ruin it for yourself. And I yeah, talk I about agree. that in the book. If you remember, Brandon, I talk about the fisherman up in Alaska. Oh, he just loved to fish. And he got a commercial fishing boat. And that was a disaster. He learned to hate fishing. Uh, but you just need to get a boring, regular, uh, non-flashy business and make it work where you don't have to show up. And in my business, two things, it's recurring revenue and I don't have to show up. And there's no reason these principles can't work in just about any business there is short of being an artist or a musician or, you know, a New York yeah. Yankee, uh, you can set up a business to run itself, which is what I've done with my life. We have more money than we need and more time than we know what to do with. We travel a lot. I walk my hounds uh, out in the woods, the beautiful Kentucky woods all the time. Diana's down shopping in Knoxville today, 90 miles away. And we have, we actually have a, a beautiful house. It's not real big because we didn't want it real big. We have the life we want. We have more time and money than we need. And the income just keeps coming in and it keeps accelerating right through this COVID nightmare. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the uh, net income kept coming up. So that's kind of the story of my life. But my life was hell till I was 50. Now at 71, it, it's, I look at it mechanically. It's everything I wanted it to be and everything she wanted it to be too. That's cool, man. Um, yeah. All right. So there's a lot to unpack there, but uh, first of all, very, very cool. I guess our audience is going to love this because like, this is what the dream is for most people who get into real estate investing, right? Is they, they it's not that they don't, yeah, they, it's not that they don't want to do any work whatsoever. It's just that they want to work on their terms. If they want to work two hours a month, great. If they want to work two hours a week, great. If they want to work two hours a day, you know, whatever it gives you that yeah. option. And, and yeah. I feel like 
the systems and the processes and, and the process that you talk through in the book, that's what can give you that flexibility and that freedom. Uh, when I first read Work the System, I remember thinking, and I even t- I've recommended it a million times. And I always say there's a there's this great book, right? The E Myth that people talk about. It's like the importance of having systems. And then there's books like the Four Hour Work Week. And I always thought the Work the System was kind of a more realistic than the Four Hour Work Week and more tangible than the E Myth. It was a, this nice like middle ground between the two of like, you can work less if you have the systems like the four hour work we talked about, then the e-myth is just very hypothetical and, and kind of big picture where you get into the nuts and bolts a little bit. So uh, kudos to you for, good. for bridging good that overview. gap. I, I kind of agree with what you're saying regarding those three books. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, maybe, maybe we can start real quick and define uh, what is the, what is this? Like, how do you define system and process? Are they the same thing? Are they different? A lot of people listen to this like, well, that sounds boring. Like, I don't want to hear a whole show about systems. Like, like how, <laughs> what is that? And why is that important? <laughs> well, this is key. This is key. Everybody wants some flashy button to push, you know, to make their life what they want it to be. But there's a certain amount of boring preparation uh, that you need to go through. And in my world, a process and a system are precisely the same thing. I also call it a machine. Uh, and I define yeah. that in the in the in the beginning of the uh, fourth edition, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, there you uh, go. Th- the, there's only there's not a lot of synonyms for system, but uh, process and system I use interchangeably. And all a system is is a trajectory of steps along a continuum from A to B. You know, and you need to know what B is. And if you've been watching the national news, there's a real question about, you know, what was the strategic objective of what happened in Afghanistan? Well, nobody seems to know, really. Uh, and, yeah. and that could go right down to your personal life. And once you see that your life is a collection of processes, and this is the first part of the book, and it encourages people uh, to think about it and meditate a little bit about it and look, uh, look at their surroundings and come to a very metaphysical place where you understand that everything in your life is a process or a system. This mic is a process and a, yeah. is a system. Uh, our bodies are systems, the lights that are shining here to fill in the shadows. That's a system too. And once you realize your life is a collection of systems, you start you st- pick out the ones that you want to work better and you work on those and you get rid of the ones that aren't working or you fix yeah. them or you create new ones based on documentation. And if you and I know there's a lot of uh, solopreneurs out there, but if you're going to someday be on your own, you're going to need to hire people. You want everybody on the same platform. And the best way to that to do that is a written word and processes and documentation. And the word strategic objective is one of our first documents. And you've heard that word a lot on the news lately. You have to know where you're going. Uh, it's, it's, it's so simple and so stupid. Kind of Obviously, if you have a target, you need to know where the target is and you need to know it's the right target. Uh, so anyway, that's my rather long ramblings about a process and a system. But the key here, the key to all of this is to understand your life as a collection of systems and you can control a lot of them. And you want to let loose the people and the systems that you can't control that are screwing up your life. Uh, the people, especially, uh, but but also processes and things that aren't working out. You need to drop them and go for the processes and the systems that do contribute to point B over here, over here. <laughs> so Sam, one thing that I think our listeners and really everybody, because the listeners of Bigger Pockets are a microcosm of the world as a whole, is sure. uh, they fall into two camps. Either they don't like the discipline that comes from systems or they want every single thing spelled out perfectly before mm-hmm. they start. And many times in life, that doesn't work out. So you're right about the situation in Afghanistan. It became a big mess. We did not have a plan for how to get out of there. And it obviously spiraled into chaos. At the same time, we didn't have 50 years before we went to sit and think about how are we going to go after terrorist organizations, say to speak, whatever your goal is. So one of the things I found with the businesses that I built is there's this sort of like climbing a mountain where you take your right hand, you pull yourself up, then your left hand has to pull yourself up. And that looks like I got to go take action, get involved in business, make some revenue and realize, oh, there's a bunch of problems. There's all these things I got to do. You sort of organize that with a system. Then you take the next step. And so I wanted to ask you what advice you have for the listeners. I liked your towel analogy, but I think that the practical way that this works out is you get out of the shower, you grab a towel, you dry yourself off. You have to figure out like, where am I going to put it? 
right? And after you do that enough times, it becomes a system for how you do things. But you don't sit down before you even get in the shower and say, well, what am I going to need when I get out? Sometimes you don't even know before you start what systems you're going to need. Can you share any advice for what that process looks like as it organically grows? Oh, sure. And one of the first systems we did in the business was how are we going to answer the phone at the office? We had three or four people that answered the phones. Some would say, hi, this is Mary. May I help you? Centratel, how can, where can I send your call? You know, everybody had a different way of doing it. But for the things you need to be perfect every single time and done by a number of people, you need to have some written documentation. Obviously, you don't need a written documentation about where to hang the towel. It's still a system. It's still a process, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and so that's very important. And I, and I want to... In fact, I want to go back to your analogy, David, the thing about climbing. Mm-hmm. Remember, you, you're climbing, free climbing, let's say free solo. It doesn't matter if you've got a rope on you or not. You're climbing. You've always got three points in contact with the ground. you got two feet, two hands. So you're holding on. Both your feet are planted. And then you reach. And then maybe you let this hand go and you flex your knees up and you take a step and you, and, and, and the three points of contact, and I had never thought of this before, but this is really good. And, and, and you inspired me. Uh, the three points of contact are your documentation pieces for the people who work for you. And for yourself, you've got the strategic objective, the operating principles and the working procedures, but you don't need to write a working procedure for everything to the point of being ridiculous. Uh, there are people who just want a free form and don't want to structure things as you described. And then, then there's these other people that need uh, direction for every move they make. Those are not yeah. entrepreneurs. Okay. The, the first, the first one you described is kind of all of us here, uh, you guys and me. And, and so uh, we really need to have some boring structure in our, in our effort, if we're going to get anywhere, otherwise it's just chaos and you've got to have a straight deliberate line from A to B, and, mm. and you've got to shed all the things that are diverting you. Maybe you have a small business, and I always use this, uh, the brother-in-law is an idiot or lazy. Uh, sorry if this 20-person uh, property management company is going to fly. The brother-in-law's got to go. He's got to go. And, and, and I know you don't want to, you know, you don't want to have a problem with your wife, but uh, there are things in our systems and process Mm -hmm. efforts that are working against us. Mm. And so the entrepreneur will be able to tell uh, where you need documentation and where you don't. The book really goes, goes into that. Now in the book, you mentioned moles. Can you, can you expand a little (laughs) bit on how that relates to what you're teaching? Do we all know what whack-a-mole is? I think everybody knows what whack-a-mole is. Oh, I was so hoping this is where you take it. Cause I literally use that phrase in our company, whack-a-mole all the time. I had it. Uh, I, uh, the game's downstairs now, but I have a box. It's uh-huh. with the whack-a-mole. Somebody gave it to me as a gift. So the That's mole cool. jumps up in a hole. You whack it with a rubber hammer. They're at carnivals all the time. Yeah. And then another one, and, then, and it goes faster and faster and faster. And that's the life most people lead. Okay. Yep. There's a problem, you fix it. There's a problem, you ignore it. Uh, and pretty soon all you're doing is killing fires. I'm jumping to another analogy now. But what you want to do uh, with the whack-a-mole is walk away from that game altogether. Don't get really mm. good at it. And people pride themselves on multitasking. Well, they're really good at it. That's really good. But it's not getting you to point B. So the boring part of this is to do a little bit of documentation. There's not a lot. But it's what solved my problem because I was able to get my message of how my, my where we were headed and how my uh, people were to operate all the same with everybody. Mm. And so we have 30 principles. We have our strategic objective and uh, we have our working procedures where if there's something technical or how do you answer the phone? You know, one, you're going to say Centratel, name of my company. Number two, this is Mary. And three, how can I help you today? And number four might be, be sure, or number one might be, put a smile on your face so you sound happy. And then two, three, four. Those little simple things are very important. You want everybody, figuratively speaking here, answering the phone in the same way. Uh, So you do that basic documentation for your crew. But for a solopreneur, uh, who doesn't have anybody, there's very little documentation. Just uh, you got to do the strategic objective, the operating principles and some working procedures. But there's a little bit of boring in this. But if you're not prepared 
there isn't anybody who's listening here who hasn't heard that you should be prepared before you start a project. Well, this mm-hmm. is what this is. That's what the work the system is, is to get ready, get your, uh, what is B exactly? And how are you going to get there? Make sure the direction is right and the sequence of your steps is correct. So when I first read Work the System, it was around the time that I decided to bring in my mother-in-law to help answer phones. It was like the very first system, I guess, I've ever uh-huh. created. Because like I got all these tenants that I had at the time, maybe a dozen tenants. And I hate talking to tenants. I just never liked it, right? They call me. They want, you know, they want their water heater fixed. I mean, come on, these demanding people. No, but I like, I just didn't want to deal with that. I wanted to go out and find deals. And so the very first thing I did, I was like, I hired my mother-in-law. I said, hey, she was just retiring. And I said, for $200 a month, will you just answer the phone call? And then she's like, well, then what do I do? And I'm like, well, I don't, I mean, I guess when, you know, if, if they got something broken, like call one of these people. And she's like, okay. And she's like, well, what do, you know, what do I say? Well, I'll do this. And so I ended up just writing. So I read the book yeah, and then I ended up write, writing down some simple systems, right? Answer the phone. Yeah. This is what we say, you know, opened our, opened our properties at the time, opened our properties. This is Rachel. Great. And then it was like, okay. And, and then if they have a problem, find out what the problem is and then call the contract. And you know what, honestly, in the beginning, like I, my system was maybe like 10 lines. It was super simple. It was just like a of one course. piece of paper, like one, two, right? three, four. Yeah, yeah sure. Yes, sure. Yeah. exactly. That's where it starts. But then you know what happened is my workload dropped in half, like just from the, like a one piece of paper, the amount of work I had to do in that business like dropped in half. And, and then, you know, of course the next day or whatever, she calls me and she says, Hey, uh, this is a problem just came up. I don't know what to deal with it. I'm like, all right, I don't know how to deal with them. I like, go, oh, okay, this is what you want to do. Can you write that down on that piece of paper? Yes. yes and then, yes. right. And then we did it. So this, this, it's kind of like the, the moles still pop up occasionally. Cause I just don't like, I can't think ahead on every single piece of the business. Like David alluded to, like we can't accurate predict everything, but then we just started writing down our systems and writing down our processes. And then pretty soon, like, I mean, I, I maybe work five minutes a month dealing with any of that rental property stuff on that side of the business. And she's still there and she's, she has all the systems. So it's just like a good picture of like property management, specifically dealing with uh, rentals is like the most perfect. uh, I mean, there's a lot of good businesses where systems work, but I it's, very systematizable. You know, you know, what's funny is my answering service. We have about 1400 clients nationwide. We have several hundred property management companies and everyone's Mm. different. And so the way any, any one of 40 different uh, telephone service representatives, operators can answer, whichever one they get is a one, two, three, four step of procedure. How do you handle a toilet leak on a Sunday afternoon? Well, you know, and how do you, how do you handle this? How do you handle a lockout? And all the steps are right there. And, and in each account, the, the accounts are put together with the same information on the same page, except it's different information for each client. But you yep. systemize, systemize, systemize. So we can handle over 300 property management companies with no errors. And every time, you know what we call an error, Brandon? We call it a red flag for improvement. And as you talked mm, about, yeah. this new thing comes up. Well, write it down. And pretty soon you have a, a procedures and you hire a new person. You say, I want you to study this. And I'll come back tomorrow and see what you've learned. I'll give you a little verbal quiz because once you learn all this, you're ready to go. And this learning by osmosis is such a horrible waste and so frustrating. You've got to be able to handle hand a new employee their instruction so they can study it. That's why we go to school is to study. And uh, so 99% of small businesses don't do that. And so their lives, the poor business owner, their lives are chaos. They might be making a couple hundred thousand dollars, but they're working 80 hours a week. They lost their family and their life, their life is a nightmare. And I, I like to say, and this is kind of a joke. And Diana mentioned this this morning from her sister-in-law. She said, uh, and we were talking about, Money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy you marshmallows, which is kind of the same thing. <laughs> you know, it's kind of it's kind of funny. But the point is, uh, money can't buy you a life, and everybody knows that. But here's a yeah. way: you say you work just a little bit of time uh, every month, and and I have one to two hours only now because of COVID, and everybody's working remotely. All our TSRs are all over the United States now, but this was an extraordinary situation. I'm probably working four hours a month instead of one hour a month lately, but uh, it's exactly right. You got to get it written down, and that's boring. And I talk about that. I talk about that extensively, that hurdle that people have to get over. And a person that needs written direction for everything they do is not an entrepreneur. 
they need to work for somebody and somebody needs to give them direction. I think what I yeah, like so about your whack-a-mole description is it's, we all know when we're playing whack-a-mole, right? The stuff sneaks up on you and you get this feeling of, oh my gosh, it's just one fire after another. I can't get out of this. I can't get into a creative mode. I can't get above my business and look at how to expand it. So to me, with our team, whack-a-mole becomes a like check engine light that you know, all right, I need yes. to stop. Something went wrong. I've I've fallen into whack-a-mole. What it happens with our real estate team is where, and a lot of the listeners probably find themselves as the moles. They start giving you objections of what they're afraid of, and you just start answering the objection. And then there's another one that comes up because their fear is the mechanism underneath the stinking machine. That's And other questions are just the moles. So what happens is my agents will start saying, Oh, well, now is a great time to buy real estate. Oh, well, yeah, there is a solution for if your tenant moves out. Oh, yeah, if the toilet breaks, we can do something to fix that. And they get sucked into this just boom, 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 and no one ever actually feels better, so they never buy. And you have to recognize these moles popping up are a symptom of a bigger problem that you're not sort of heading this off. So I I don't know that it's ever, like Brandon said, a, a possibility that you will never have a mole. It's more that when you find yourself with moles, you need to take a step back, like what Sam is saying, and say, how do I write down, document, create a system that prevents these moles from popping up? Now, I know, Sam, you basically came up with this concept because you feel like your own life or your business was just a huge mess. I see that you were about to miss payroll. You were you were possibly going to lose the company, and you had a middle-of-the-night epiphany. Can you describe yeah. what that scenario was like and how you came up with these concepts? Yeah, this is – I love telling the story uh, – so I I was, have you ever been so tired? You have a lump in the middle of your chest as you lie down at night to go to sleep and you're getting three hours of sleep. Well, I was working 110 hour work weeks for a period of seven months. And I talk about the whole thing in the book. I went to bed one night. I was going to miss the payroll in a week. I knew I was lost. I gave up. I said, I can't, I can't fight this anymore. I just, I'm not going to make this payroll. I don't have the strength. I don't have the energy. I just don't want to do this anymore. And I laid there and immediately, this is three in the morning. And it was either a dream or a vision or just a thought process. I'm not sure what it was, but I had a vision of a table with my business pieces on it. There was how we answer the phone over here. There was how we handle a complaint over here is how we make payroll over here. It's how we handle a customer complaint. And here's the key on the top of this table, very metaphysical kind of a thing they were all in pieces. There was, they were not connected. There was a, the piece here. There was the piece here. There was the piece here. And they were all systems and processes. And I realized in that moment, and it really was in a moment, and it was in 1999, I realized that my life was a collection of systems and I'm going to try something different. I'm going to lose my business anyway. Let me try something whacked out. So I went to the office the next day and I said, here's how we're going to do this. You, my two managers I was talking to, I only had, I don't know, 12 or 15 people at that time. I have about 60 now, but uh, I said, here's what we're going to do. What is the biggest problem we have today? Oh, what do you mean, Sam? We have lots of problems. No, the biggest one that's causing the most problem. And it was making the deposit because we take checks in the mail and we were having cash flow problems of making the deposit. Remember three weeks ago, you, I forget her name at this time. That was a long time ago. Uh, you came to me and said, I lost a deposit under the, my car seat. I was late picking up my kid. I was supposed to drop the $3,000 deposit at the bank on my way to pick up the kid. And I forgot. And I was cleaning the car. And there it was under the seat. So you're either going to fire me or give me a hug. (laughs) I I said, that's an extra $3,000 we sure can use. So the biggest problem, and all three of us were putting these very complex deposits together for the bank in different ways. And we're having all kinds of problems. Uh, The veterinarian in Virginia was sent a payment in and uh, it would cover, cover the HVAC guy in Tennessee. Okay, and and it would go to the wrong place. And now we got two problems. We're having all kinds of problems just putting money in the bank and and recording it carefully. So we fixed that. We all sat together. It was 53 steps. We came up with a process. We all contributed to this. And uh, we came up with a 53-step written process. And I've never had a problem again. The best part about it is at that time, I was one of the three people making the deposits. And I spent I uh, maybe two hours a week doing a deposit. This person paid, this person paid, this person paid, and putting it in the software and getting it to the bank. I handed that 53-step document to somebody else in the office, and I haven't done 
uh, a deposit since 1999. And so you figure you it go. out two de- two hours a week, probably two to four hours a week for 20 some years. And it, and when we did that and we saw the results, it took us about three days to put this together. And I did most of the work. I figure I used eight hours of my time. And, and now I've never done a deposit again. And that's what we've done with every system in the office. And that's how you get to delegation. And our, our mantra is automate, delegate, delete. Automate, delegate, delete. Every time you see a new task or, um, David, you know, a, a new uh a new problem pops up, you ask those three questions. And as I said, uh, and as you pointed out, every time a problem comes up, you look at it and what can you do so it doesn't happen again? And that's why we call problems red flags for improvement. And in our office, we just don't have any problems anymore. And if they do jump up, we're all over them. We document it. We decide decide what we're going to do. We just don't have You're any good. problems. You know, we just don't. Yeah. Yeah. After yeah, some, a while, at, some at first, at first yeah. it's really bad, but uh, as yeah. you go on, they decrease to zero. It really, it really does. Eventually, like you get to the point where they just like things don't come up. That's why I'm like, I work like five minutes a month, and it's usually my wife like talking some quick question over with me over that rental portfolio in Washington yeah. State. Uh, like I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, like for example, oh yeah, we should sell that property. Like that's a, a rather like <laughs> rare thing that happens once a decade. And so I'm like, all right, let's have that conversation. But yeah, yeah. eventually the the problems just get documented. A lot of times I think we think that our problems are very unique and that there's always these things go on. But when you really boil it down, there's just a handful of problems. They just happen over and over and over. And so when yeah. you find ways to automate or delegate or delete them uh, or systematize them, they just go away. Uh, one one more like scenario or, or example of how I've used this in my life I want to throw out there. Um, and then we'll, I want to move on to the kind of the second half of the show where we bring in your, uh, your Josh. Is that, that's his name, right? Yeah, Josh. And so I want to all right, I'll ask you in a second where you where you met Josh at. But um, I was going to say, like, so over the past couple of years, two years ago, I decided I wanted to get heavy into commercial real estate, like a mobile home parks, apartment complexes and whatever. And I set this like three year goal. I wanted to buy a thousand units. And uh, we just now we're two and a half years into this thing or two years into this thing. And we're just crossing 3000 units here this <laughs> month. We'll hit a, we'll over triple. I'll end the year with over four. Right. And I work yeah. maybe four hours a week in open door capital, that, that side. And I, I talk a lot about this and, you know, I brag about, it. I'm like, look at how awesome this is going. All I did is I built a machine that I wasn't part of. And when I say, when I, I will try to explain what I meant by that. It's like, I built a machine It's like, this piece goes to this piece goes this one. It's a little engine. And then I step back and I'm like, Whoa, I built an engine. And all that means is I built a bunch of, and not even me, like my team built systems that all rely on each other. And I just am the guy on top, like just kind of tinkering a little bit. And so it just kind of shows like that. Exactly. That's one, precisely it. Yeah. 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 So, so on one hand, I, there's businesses where people work in the business for 20 years and then they slowly get out. And because they build a machine out of what the mess that they have of all these parts. And the other side of it is you could start from the beginning yeah. Building the machine. I was in I was in a Safeway bathroom yesterday, like Safeway grocery store bathroom. And sure. I was like, this is the most disgusting looking bathroom I've ever been in. This is awful, right? Which is pretty typical for Maui. But I'm like, this is terrible. <laughs> and I was like, man, if only there was a company that was called like, you know, commercial bathroom remodelers, right? Uh, and I'm like, and I'm like, this would be a really system systematizable business to run. I'm like, I can think of a dozen employees that you have, and it just all they do is commercial bathroom remodel. It's not a sexy business, it's not you know exciting, but it's so systematizable. I'm like, yeah. you go this tile, we go in at night, we remodel this thing, and I like had this whole business. By the time I left the bathroom, I had an entire business plan worked out of like how I, this could be a business that I don't work in. I could build that machine. Now I'm not going to. But I could build that machine because it's really a mindset thing, right? It's like, I'm going to approach this like a machine or like a system, or I'm just going to approach it as I can get there and do everything. Yeah, whack-a-mole. And that's, uh, yeah. yeah. Whack-a-mole, sure. yeah. No, that's, yeah. and we use that term, build a machine all the time. Uh, let's yeah. build this machine. It might be a marketing effort or something. We're yep. going to build this machine and then I'm going to be micromanaging the hell out of it until it's built. And then I don't want anything more to do with it. I'm done. There you and are. so the owner <laughs> makes sure the machine is built the way they want it. It's headed in the right direction. And then everybody else does the work. Well, let me, uh, let me leave is. you with one last thing here. If we're toward yeah, the end. Please. And what is the difference between a small struggling business and a large successful business? It's documentation. 
If you think mm, about it, every yeah. large business is documenting and working on their systems. And that's the beautiful thing about documentation is you have to write your one, two, three, four, five step. You know, remember things happen in sequence across a, a, a linear uh, uh, a linear piece of time. And if you don't have it down, what those steps are supposed to be, and, then, and if they're not in the right sequence, you're going to have a problem. And writing it down does that yeah. for you. But this is so, so little a percentage of the time uh, that an entrepreneur would use, even in the, even in the short term, it, it doesn't take that much time to do, as you know, Brandon and David. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, such a good way to run your business. I mean, we we run everything through a program called Asana or a lot of it through Asana, where it's just sure. checklists yeah. on checklists on checklists. Yeah. And so when we when we get a new property under contract, I goes, and, and here's a funny thing. I was sh- telling this group of people that I had a, a, a master class out here in Maui, and I'm telling these people about this, how systems and processes work in our business. And then I realized I've never actually seen like the systems that my team goes through to close on a property. And I know that they have them and they're in a sauna somewhere. So I pulled it up in front of everybody and I'm going through this, these like hundreds of different, like, you know, points and checklists that interrelate to each other. And I was blown away, not by the fact that they have them, but the fact that I didn't have to build them because it's kind of another point here. Yeah. When you hire the right people and you train them in the mentality of systems, they will create the systems internally. And like, you don't even have to build every single one yourself. Yeah, so yeah, I was there a was a changer. point there was a point not too far from the beginning when I didn't write them anymore. I check them. Yeah. Uh, but yep. I don't I don't write them anymore. They yeah, the people who work for me understand that it works. They make an awful lot of money yeah. the people who work for me. And, <laughs> and many of them have been with me for over 20 years, one up to 30 years. Wow. And uh wow. they get the process thing and you can pay your people a lot, you can ask a lot for what you sell. Uh, if your product is the best that's out there and that's what you want. And we advertise Centratel, our answering service, as the highest quality answering service in the United States. And actually, that's statistically true of the 800 services out there. Centratel is the very best. I say that with full confidence. And they all know that and they're proud to work there and they make double what they make at any other service. And so if you're the best, you're in rare territory. Dude, I I, I just oh. kind of had this idea that just came from what you said. You can say you can charge, basically you can charge more. Oh, yeah. I mean, essentially you're saying you yeah. can charge more when your systems are good. And I started thinking, well, I'm right now I'm planning a Disney World trip. So I'm going to Disney World after uh, our Bigger Pockets conference this year. And I'm, I just spent, I don't know, I'm going to spend like 20 grand on Disney World tickets. It's ridiculous, right? And I'm yeah. doing like this yeah. insane trip. <laughs> and I'm like, why, why does Disney, why are they able to charge me so much money? It's because Disney is one of the best systems businesses in the world. Like every, the reason they're able to charge thousands and thousands of dollars to people to come hang out and you go to like, you know, random county fair and you're paying $8 to get in. It's because <laughs> of their systems. Like exactly. That's, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. That's funny because the better your systems are, the more smooth everything works, the more, the more high quality everything feels and looks, and then the more money people are willing to pay. And that's well, true huge, for everybody. A huge segment of any business is the top 10% that just don't care how much it costs as long as there's no problems. Yep. Right. Yep. And so we, <laughs> yes. we cater to the 10% of property managers, for instance, out there that just don't want problems. It's, it's still a tiny, yep. tiny percentage of 1%, what we cost. Uh, yep. and, and it's more than a lot of the other ones, but they don't have problems. You don't get the wrong, the, the wrong on call person called up in the middle of the night or the wrong property on call person called up. And, and so you just don't have mistakes and people will, your 10% will pay for it. Let, let the other property managers struggle over the 90% that are fighting about the cost all the time. Yeah, there you go. I, yeah. I, it's such a phenomenal point. Such a good point. And it's true for rentals too. Like if you're a good rent rental property owner and you do a really good job and your systems are great, you can charge higher rent because there are people who just want to rent from a great landlord yeah. and they're, and, yeah. and because your systems are so good, you're going to have an easier time attracting good people. And you got, yeah, it's from the rental side, from being a real estate agent, like a good real estate. I like David, I, I, if David would like, if there was a real estate agent that was like, I'll charge you 10% instead of 6%, but they were like insuring me no problems, I'd have no problem paying it. If there was a, uh, a, a contractor that was charging $90 an hour instead of 50, but they took care of the problems because they were systematized, I'd have no problem paying it. That's a great deal. I have deal. no problem paying it <laughs> yeah. for that. Yeah, That's it's a great, great deal. Great deal. Yeah. Good yep. ROI or whatever. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, man. That's it. All right, so so we're gonna shift over to our second half of the show now, and we'll uh, we'll wrap up later with the with the famous four, uh, which is kind of last four questions we ask. But right now, I'm just quick question on how you found Josh. Where Josh come from into the picture before well, we bring him in? Yeah, Josh was a sales guy who came into Bend 
10 years ago we met actually uh, 2011 and uh he found my book somewhere and he saw that i lived in bent so he called me and we sat down and he was thinking about starting a business and he thought he'd like to talk to this author and uh, I think he had the copy you had first edition. <laughs> I'm yeah. not too close to it. Uh, and so we had uh, Jackson's Corner. We had a uh, a meeting. He said, will you meet me for coffee? And I did. And we got to talk and talk and talk and talk. And, and he really liked the concept. And so he ended up working for me for a long time. And three years ago, I said, Josh, why don't you go out on your own? I, I've got this other stuff I want to do. Take care of it. And uh, so yeah. we still communicate all the time, of course. And he's a good guy. And he's, he, he gets it the way I get it. And, and that he gets it in his guts, how it works. And he's, I think he's had over a thousand consulting clients in his wow. time. He's very good at what he does. That's yeah. awesome, man. Well, we, we wanted to bring him in today because we want to actually bring in a few uh, guests of, you know, or, or listeners of the Bigger Pockets podcast and have Josh and you kind of like uh, help talk with them about how to implement this in real life. It's one thing to talk about the theoretical of what this works. And let's talk about how we can actually implement this. So with that said, why don't we bring in Josh? All right, Josh, welcome to uh, welcome to the show. Uh, Sam, Sam says good things about you. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sure some of them are true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, why don't we, why don't we get a quick uh, background on you? I mean, we heard Sam's, Sam's like how he met you. What were you doing before you got into the world of, uh, you know, work on the system? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> actually I started my career off, uh, as an architect. So actually I was involved in real estate early on, oh, cool. but, uh, due to, uh, 2007, 2008, when everything crashed, I had to find a new career and no one wanted to hire me in real estate. And so, uh, I did what I thought I would never do, which is become a business consultant. So I wrote my thesis paper about why you should never hire a business consultant. So I had a very <laughs> big distaste for them, but no one hired me. So I just start off and just be become a business consultant. And at the time, I was traveling the country from location to location to location, helping companies with their inside sales and their outside sales and their operations and their um, helping them through bankruptcy. I work with a lot of flooring stores, um, helping them hire helping the fire, you name it. I was just flying on an airplane from place to place, to place. And, and it was, um, it was killing me. And I moved to Bend, Oregon. Uh, I think Sam shared part of the story. I, I met him for, for coffee uh, or for lunch. And I had read his book and I saw this is, this is the key to the issues I was having my, with my clients, which was I would help them with their problems and then I would leave. And then six months or a year or two, or two years later, I would, realized they had all the same problems, like nothing actually stuck. And so they'd call me back in, I'd fly back into the same thing and it would break again. It kept breaking. And I realized there's actually a better way. And it was a different way to, to see business. And it was a different way to work in business, which is, you know, the work system method. And uh, once I realized that I was missing this whole documentation part, that's what really got me bought into the fact that instead of just investing in me as a consultant to, you know, try to wow them with some new idea, they could actually invest in a sustainable solution that that could scale. And so one of the biggest um, turning points for me was, was realizing that one of my first clients, we had this massive transformation. They were going through bankruptcy. We helped them reorganize. And, you know, it was, it was a complicated job. And he was off the races with, with huge success. And then, you know, a few years later, I look at his LinkedIn profile. And instead of being the CEO of a, you know, $6 million business, he's now a salesperson doing what he used to do when he was 22 and he's mm -hmm. 65. And I realized like what we did was great, but then it just didn't stick. And uh, that's why this, this method works so well because it actually makes sure the good ideas stick and you can build off of them. Awesome, man. Well, so today now you're, uh, I mean, just for clarity, you're not, when, when you say you work with Sam, you're not running the telephone business, correct? It's the consult, <laughs> more of a consulting side. Yeah. Well, Sam's a true entrepreneur. So he's always, you know, started new companies, new ideas, new initiatives, you know, software company, nonprofit politics. And so one of the things that we, we started working on together, uh, was people kept knocking on his door or calling him to get help. And they wanted help with their business. And Sam didn't get this freedom to then start working, <laughs> you know, and traveling the country. And so we had met. And it was just a great timing for me to start actually working with these people who wanted help. So with their coaching, with their consulting. And so at that point, uh, I think, you know, I'm probably forgetting some steps along the way, but it was like a contractor to employee to then working really closely together. And now uh, at this point, 
I'm actually taking this message and certifying other consultants in the same methodology. And then they're out there around the world in different languages with different specialties, systemizing uh, those businesses uh, in those industries. Because um, as you probably can guess, uh, there's a lot of companies that need help with this. And I'm just one guy. And I hit a plateau and I knew that I had to um, scale what I did. Yeah, that makes sense, man. Well, we thought we'd uh, take advantage of that today and have you do some consulting directly here on the podcast <laughs> with a few of our listeners. So um, what I, wa- what I want to do is I want to move this over to actually bring in uh, three different listeners of the Bigger Pockets podcast one at a time, and, and they're going to kind of go through their story a little bit, uh, but more specifically where they're struggling with the system side of things. And we thought maybe you could uh, do what you do best and help them. Does that all sound good, everyone? <laughs> that sounds great. All right, man. Well, with that said, why don't we... Uh, why don't we bring in our first, Susan. Welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast. Thank you. Super excited to be here. What an honor. Thank well, you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'll let uh, Josh, I'll let you got you and Susan uh, take it from here, and then uh, I'll jump back in again uh, in a bit. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Well, Susan, why don't you tell us and the audience where what the status is of your business and uh, where you're stuck? So I'm a brand new investor um, in my 50s. I uh, just started a couple of months ago listening to the Bigger Pockets podcast. Um, and the uh, Rookie Real Estate Podcast as well. Um, I just closed on my first investment property, and I feel like, you know, the dog that chases the car, I feel like I've caught the car and I don't know what to do with it now. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so and it's just like thinking of the process that I followed um, to get the home. And um, now I'm trying to get contractors. It's all been, it's, it's a lot of steps and it did not naturally flow. So I would like to apply a different approach to scale up my business. Um, I know I need to build a team um, and, or several teams as I'm all, as I'm also interested in investing out of state. Um, And so what are some of the steps that I can implement and the systems to make this repeatable on a larger scale? Yeah, great question. I'm sure your question hits home a lot of people here listening. Um, Are you doing this full time or is this a a part time side gig for you? It was part time up until a couple of days ago. I actually just lost my W2 job, but (laughs) it's okay. (laughs) Yeah. So I will be looking, I will be looking for another W2 um, because I just have this first investment property plus my primary home. That's definitely not enough to live off of. And I do rely on conventional financing at this point. So yes, it will be part-time. Well, uh, if you caught the first part of the episode with Sam, I think that the first key thing, uh, and it's not like you already got it, is to, or is to see that what you're doing in your business is can be a system, right? It's made up of separate pieces and they're chronological, they're through time. And that's the first piece. A lot of people never get that. They just think their work, their business is them and therefore they have to do it all themselves. And this kind of business, I've worked with plenty of people doing what you do, um, it can be systemized, right? And you're certainly learning from the best here at Bigger Pockets. Now, um, the next key thing, once you understand the pieces, what you do is to understand where you're trying to go, right? So some people... They're trying to build a real estate empire. Some people are trying to build, you know, I don't know, a property management firm. Others really like the remodeling aspect. Um, so that would be the second piece I would, I would ask you for before we get to the tactical pieces, which would be, what do you want this to look like in 10 years? Like, where, where are you going with this business? So I'm in my 50s and I've set a goal to do 60 doors by the time I'm 60, um, which is nothing to Brandon's 3,000 that he just closed on in two years. So. No, it's it's awesome, Susan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I I initially um, just want to wanted to offset retirement income, or I'm sorry, have an extra stream for retirement income. Um, Because looking at, I've worked all my life and, um, you know, my 401k is really small compared to what I know that I'm going to need. I enjoy travel. I enjoy good food. um, And I want to be able to leave a legacy. Okay. Well, so this, this next step in terms of understanding where you want to go or where you want the business to be, Mm -hmm. um, really what it does is helps laser focus your efforts. So the idea of real estate investing, um, as you know, and I'm, I'm not an investor, this is not my specialty, but, um, you know, I've worked with people who have done mobile home parks. I've worked with people who have done high rises. I've worked with people who've done, you know, residential, custom, you know, multifamily. There's 
a lot of different types of real estate and there's a lot of different ways to make money in real estate. And so I think your key thing would be to as much as possible, say, I'm going to be searching for this type of property and this kind of location with this type of, you know, range in terms of, you know, it's million dollar homes or $200,000 homes, you know, so the more you can really laser focus, um, you know, the customer, the product, uh, you know, the location, the more you're simplifying your business from the get go, um, the more complicated and broad your perspective is uh, and loose, the less likely you are to make it into a systematic solution. If it's just, I want to be a real estate investor, well, then you really can't, you can't systemize that. But if it's very specific, you're going to be a lot better off. And that's why I would, I mean, I wouldn't say spend, spend weeks or months. I would just say spend, uh, you know, part of a day, a couple hours and really write down that aspect and then write down the pin- principles for decision-making. That's kind of the step, second step we go through. Uh, these, all these steps can be done day one. And once you have the clarity of where you want to go, how you want to get there, uh, really basic stuff, then you can move on to the systems. And you mentioned that this is very complicated. Uh, and you're right to, to be a real estate investor is complicated because there's people who dedicate their lives only to property management or only to remodeling or only to be in a realtor. I had one client who was a home stager. All she did is helped stage homes to get the, the highest value that that was her business. So, so being, um, you know, being an investor, like what you are doing, um, it's it's complicated, right? You're weaving lots of different individual businesses into one business to create a lot of value. And so um, you're going to want to make sure the path you do take, and it sounds like your current path is meandering, is consistent as much as possible, right? Uh, so don't go buy uh, a high end and try to flip it in a day. And then next week, go buy a low end house and try to hold it for six months. The next week, try to buy a multifamily. And then next week, try to, you know, buy... Uh, uh, like a mobile home, like you have to be really consistent as much as possible. That would probably be my, my initial strategic advice. Um, so hopefully is, does that making sense so far? It does. It does. Um, okay. Can I ask a clarifying question, please? Yeah. So you mentioned principles of decision-making. Huh? Is that uh, what's a simple way to. Yeah. So, so the methodology we, we, we use we called the work system method. You can get it um, the, the book for those who don't know, haven't heard of it or missed the first half. Uh, workthesystem.com. We do uh, have a download of the book or you can purchase it. But the the concept is, first off, you have to think differently, which is the mindset. Second piece, you have to know where you're going, which is the strategic objective. The third piece is the operating principles. If you and your team and those you work with uh, internally and externally um, are operating under the same principles, they're going to make decisions the way you would. Like it's hard to hand something off to someone else if they don't have the same principles or guidelines for decision making. And so uh, with a situation like yours, you would just start off with a handful of concepts which have to do with, um, you know, customer service guidelines or what kind of technology you want to use or, um, you know, the simplest solution is invariably the correct solution. That's yeah. usually one we write down. Um, so principles like that. And that's that's the, the foundation, right? So that's the foundation which you're always going to be drawing on. But again, that's not going to make you money tomorrow. Or time. What's going to be the you know the practical next piece for you is going to be when you actually look at you know from start to finish what it takes or what it has taken you to do your first real estate deal and find the piece you know break off the piece that is either taking you the most time is the most frustrating is the most repeatable is the most discreet it's the easiest for you to package up and hand off. Uh, earlier in the show, Brandon was talking about um, all the tenant phone calls, right? Just breaking off the piece of tenant phone calls is a great piece to to break off. Um, and so finding out the different pieces of your business and then identifying which one of those are going to be repeatable in your future real estate endeavors. So um, and, and a way to think about this, which might be helpful, is that if you're going to be doing, uh, what do you say, 10 deals a year? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Well, if you're only going to do an activity once a month, that's not, you're not going to get a whole lot of utility out of it. But if you're doing something 10 times a day, that would be a great example of maybe something you should isolate, document, and find someone to to help you with that. 
Uh, it could be research. It could be answering the phone. It could be, you know, place uh, listing properties. And that would be the way to, to kind of think through it. Uh, and then the other, uh, I guess, thing I wanted to bring up before I let you <laughs> tell me where I'm, where I'm wrong here, and you can push back, right, is you mentioned out-of-state investing. Mm-hmm. And I just would make you think back to your the first point, which is building a simple business. And, uh, and I, I've had clients do this, real estate investors, where they invest in this state and they invest in that state and they invest in this state and their life becomes hellish. <laughs> so, yeah. so consider, uh, is that really going to take you where you want to go? And um, maybe that'll make you shift with regards to location as well. No, that's great. Thank you. That's, uh, um, I'm in Tacoma, Washington, so not far uh-huh. from where Brandon started. And um, so I do have uh, my some ties in the Cincinnati area, which is a really good area to invest in as well. And I'm looking to from moving from single family to uh, multifamily. This has been so helpful. Thank you so much. Good. Oh, great, great questions. Hopefully it helped. And I know it was very broad, but uh, take the time, write down your thoughts and you got to start somewhere, right? So even if it's just isolating a few things and you have a part-time assistant just to get you started, every piece, you know, and, and Sam could detail that the hundreds of procedures they have, have right now, but it starts with one. You know, it just starts with one. Yeah. And then you have a little bit of time, then it goes to two, and then you just build from there. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Susan. Appreciate yeah, you. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, with that said, we're going to move on to the next, uh, I guess, guest for today's show. Uh, Josh, that was awesome. So thank you. So why don't we bring in Karina? Am I saying your name correctly, Karina? Yes, that's correct. And look at that, Karina. All right. Welcome to the show. <laughs> thank you. Hi, guys. I'm Karina. Um, I have a few properties, um, but I would like to have more time to kind of focus on the investing side of things. I have I'm doing pretty well in my real estate job in that um, it's something that I want to continue to grow. Um, but I want to ease my time commitment off of that. So I want to build systems that essentially not only increase my sales, but allow me to have the capabilities of building out a team in the future. But I'm not exactly sure what I should start with. So I guess the question is, what? how do I know what I should systemize and how do I go about actually implementing it? Which I know Sam touched on a little bit earlier, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, Josh. Yeah, well, definitely. So, and and I don't want to re, re, regurgitate what I said with the last uh, person for those watching the, the show here, but um, if I were you in your circumstance and you already knew where you wanted to go, let's say you have some clarity and you're having some great success, you already have money coming in the door, so you, you, you've um, done things enough times to know what works and what doesn't work, especially as a, a realtor, sounds like you're a realtor, right? Correct. Yeah. So what I would do is actually list out in chronological order all the different pieces that go into being uh, a great realtor, you know, what, what you've done to be successful. And that might be the, the way you list the property, the way you price it, the way you um, advertise it, the way you greet people when they come in, the way you do open houses, all the different pieces, right? And I think that those, those would actually be a, um, having those pieces listed out is going to help you be strategic about making a decision. I think that's the hardest thing is people say, I want this systemized. It's really, it's very overwhelming. Right. Um, I've actually thought about this with regards to my, my marriage. My wife is like, I want to have a great marriage. Okay. Well, what are the different components? What are the different pieces? What are the different, and so let's make sure each piece, each system is running optimally. Right. And it's going to be the same with, with you. And, and as a realtor, there's a lot of a lot of your energy probably is spent running around doing a lot of manual things, and obviously you're good at it. So you can find people who are less experienced, uh, less trained, less expensive to do a lot of those those tasks for you. So I would I would focus more on systemizing uh, and documenting what you're currently doing well, because the other part of your business, which is real estate investing, is more experimental at this point in time. You're still testing things out. You're still figuring things out. You're still not sure, is this going to work or is that going to work? You're not, there's still so many unknowns that to start to build a team in that side of the business is going to be way more risky. And you might build things that you have to trash later on. But if you already have a current revenue stream that you feel really confident in, 
those would be the, the pieces to free yourself up and um, give yourself that extra time and money to invest in um, in real estate investing. Is that making sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I have a follow up question. Uh-huh. Do you think I and this could also go to David? I know that he has a team himself, but um, do you think that I need to wait until I have all of these systems in place before I hire somebody or bring somebody onto my team or should I wait? I certainly wouldn't, I wouldn't wait. Yeah. I mean, don't think of your team as in like the annual salary of to pay them, let's just say 40 or 50 grand. Um, think of it in terms of, can I get the ROI out of this person within the next 60 days? Like, can I, can I hit the break even within 60 days? I bring them on and yeah, I've got to train them and, and maybe your systems aren't all procedurized and documented yet, but you're going to get there with them. Will they start paying for themselves within 60 days? Okay, well then it's worth just bringing them on right now. Um, it's it's almost never happens where you're going to bring someone on and you're just going to hand them, here are the procedures on how to do your work from, from step one to step 100. Um, unless you're an established business and you've had the time to build it out. Um, newer companies, you're bringing them on and say, here's you know 50 things I want you to do. We have the first two of them procedurized. And now as you get started, we're going to work on getting the rest of them documented, right? And so as long as they buy into the strategy, they understand your principles, they understand where you're going. Uh, and this is a, a big it's a big way to attract people to your team is if, if you're an entrepreneur that actually has a direction, you actually know where you're going and they can see your ambition. And they can also see that you're um, organized, like you're actually going to make it happen. They'll be excited to, to join their team and they'll understand why they're actually building these procedures as they're working with you. So I I would not wait to get things documented first. I would do it with them. And one of the easiest ways to do that is just like Brandon mentioned, which is as you're training them, they are involved in documenting it, right? So you're either uh, video recording, you're Zoom recording, you're audio recording, you're, you're doing something where your knowledge is not being told to them and they're forgetting half of it it's being told to them in a way that's recorded and then they're applying it and they're documenting it. And as, as, as I like to say, um, you know, people come and go, but systems stay right. So they might leave. They probably will leave in a year or two, but what you built with them is going to continue on. And then that's going to give you more confidence to bring on more and more people. And I would say, especially in when I've worked with other realtors, it's, it's a job where, there's a lot of activity, right? This is volatile. People come, they go, they do a part-time, they move. It, it's hard to get somebody you can really trust to be consistent. And so the more you can get them to write down what you do, because you're telling them, uh, the better off you're going to be in terms of stability. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Also, Karina, with the real estate agent business specifically, there is a lot more flexibility in this industry than in a typical job that Josh would usually be giving people advice for. So one of the things that we'll do is we'll take an agent in our office who isn't doing a lot of production and really wants something to do, wants to learn. And I don't have to pay them like an administrator. I'm going to pay them through training. So you'll find someone you have chemistry with. You'll find someone who's good work ethic that represents your brand well. And you'll take a chunk of what you do and say, look, I will pay you to do these things, but you can pay them out of the commission so that you're, if you don't sell houses, you're not locked into costs that you can't afford. And then as they get better at doing that job, you can slowly start to pay them a higher chunk. If you get enough income that's coming in from lots of deals that you can afford to move them to hourly, you can do that. And like Josh was saying, you'll sort of develop those systems at a very low risk way to yourself as far as putting out money. This is one of the industries where there's just a ton of people who so badly want someone to teach them the way and there isn't anyone to do it. We need more mentorship in this space. So I run a uh, like a webinar mastermind for real estate agents because there's so many people that want to learn. They all are just hungry. Like, just tell me what to do. I'll do whatever you want. Just tell me, how do I do this? So I think for you specifically, you're doing some production. You have a good way that you carry yourself. There's lots of agents that look up to you and you could finally, you could find some cheap or free labor because they just want the training. And then once they're good and you're like, okay, I want to commit to this person, then you can give a formal job offer. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I actually have had people reach out to me I guess I have felt like I didn't know I wasn't in that position yet to, to serve as a mentor yet. Um, but I think that I may be wrong about that. So it's something I will explore. Thank you You're guys. Totally wrong about that. Every <laughs> agent thinks that they don't know enough. 
you definitely, you know more than them and that's all that matters. Thank you. Thanks, Karina. That's appreciate Great you questions. coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Right, Thanks, well, guys. Yeah. Well, let's move to the next, uh, next segment. Last guest we're going to bring in right now. All right, Matthew, welcome to the show, man. Good to have you here. Awesome. Honored for the opportunity. Yeah, man. Well, this is Josh. Josh, Matthew, I'll let you guys uh, do what you do best. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, Josh. All right, Matthew, why don't you, why don't you give uh, me and the audience uh, the background? What's going on in your business? Absolutely. So I've grown from zero to 31 rentals in the past nine months. I first started out with a five unit, then a 10 unit, now a 16 unit. I have a highly profitable niche here in Iowa, what I like to call tweener towns. I call them that because they're the towns between the big towns where people live. Uh, with the ability to burr and get 100% of my money back within six months of seasoning. I've done one already, and I'm in the process of two as we speak. Uh, I know I need to hire outside management to continue to grow, and I realize that I need to continue to outsource more of my life uh, and business, You know, more of those $10 an hour tasks in favor to free me up to do those you know, $10,000 an hour tasks. Uh, however, I know that uh, you know I have a tremendous work ethic, and I know how to do everything because I've kind of grown up in the business uh, so what's kind of like a 12 step, uh, you know, baby step program for me to slowly outsource things, uh, you know, may, maybe scale the outsourcing. So it feels gradual uh, of, of getting benefit as opposed to losing control. That is, uh, I don't know if you can do a, a slow 12 step program. If you're moving that fast, <laughs> you might want to <laughs> accelerate the delegation. I think you're about to get crushed with a lot of, uh, a lot of problems pretty soon here. Um, so have you ever done property management before for this many tenants? Uh, no, it's my first time. All right. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm not a real estate pro, but uh, I suspect that um, as you reach this critical mass where you, you basically can't keep up with the phone calls and the issues, you're going to want to outsource some things. And um, obviously you're, you're, you're skilled at finding properties, it sounds like, and skilled at uh, the financing and, and all this, the strategy aspects. And that's really where you should spend your time, right? So entrepreneurs need to stay in their, their sweet space. The stuff that, you know, it's pretty hard to come up with a system for all of the creative problem solving that went into finding these deals and, and making them a success. But there are a lot of things that are super sim- simple and, and boring and repeatable, such as the tenant phone call of, you know, my, my toilet's plugged or there's a leak in the ceiling. All those things are going to be happening, right? The maintenance is going to happen. People are going to not pay their rent on time. All those things are going to happen. And so, and I'm, I'm kind of leading you towards a certain answer here, but I would break apart your business into the separate pieces. And it sounds like there's an aspect of research there's an aspect of, you know, closing the deals all the way to um, managing all the way to selling them. But what I see is there's discrete businesses that already do elements of that. And one of those discrete businesses is a property management company. So if you really want to scale and grow and keep it really simple, uh, you know, a system you could plug in would just be having a, a partner property management company do the property management for some of those, some of the, you know, all your tenants. So you can spend your time where the big dollars are, not spend your time trying to deal with all the, the little headaches. That seems like the easiest solution. So that, that could be an approach. The other approach would be to build it all in-house, uh, which I get the sense that's not going to be your personality where you build every single thing in-house, but I could be wrong about that. And it seems like, at least initially, that might not be the way to go. It seems like you may want to start outsourcing uh, those elements, and then if it makes sense to where there are units that are clustered in a certain area, potentially you could bring someone on. But I think until we hit you know, 100 units or so within a, a certain radius, it may not make financial sense for us to consider that path. Yeah. Well, I, th- I think that's a, a great way to think about it. Right now, are all your units within the same location or are they spread out? Uh, they're all within about a two hour driving distance. So they're okay. pretty spread out. Pretty spread out. And then um, is the future, and then going back to our initial step, which is a strategic objective, like is the future for you, um, you know, the next 10 years going to be hundreds and hundreds of you, these units? Or are you planning on just kind of s- stopping at a a, a safe area and then just kind of managing it like a personal lifestyle business. Yeah. Initially my goal was to replace hundred percent of our income with cash flow from the rentals when, when they were all paid off, say refinance mm-hmm. and put them on 10 year notes. And then when the kids go to college, we've got three kids. Uh, my wife and I can do whatever we want. Uh, well, we accomplished that 10 year goal over the first, uh, you know, nine months of, of doing this. So <laughs> I, I you know, I'm, I, I'm a high achiever and I feel like if I don't continue to challenge myself to grow this, to be more, I'm going to have regrets and I don't want to have any regrets in my life. So I feel like, um, 
you know, I've, I've got a profitable niche and I want to continue to grow. And as long as there are properties that are going to still fit the bill for what's our sweet spot, I think we need to continue to buy. And, and maybe that means retiring from a W-2 earlier than, than what I'm planning on. But, uh, but yeah, I think, I think uh, we continue to want to grow. I mean, why, why not 10x where we're at now and get to 300 you know and then see where we get from there <laughs> yeah i think that's i think that's great i mean congratulations kudos to you for for doing what you're, what you're doing um i i think that the the key thing especially if you have still a w2 uh, right now would be to make sure that all the aspects of your business that are going to absorb your time on an ongoing basis which are not entrepreneurial again are taken care of either by outsourcing externally or internally by bringing in people to do those various things. And if you don't have the the time to train them or the skill set or the the desire to bring on all internal team members, then it's simple to outsource to again property management companies, things like that. And then over time, if you have a large enough portfolio and you want to bring it in house, you can, right? Uh that's that's pretty common for a lot of industries. I'm just working with a uh, a lumber yard right now that that went, you know, now they do all things. They design the buildings, they install the buildings, they deliver the material, they do everything. They they manufacture the material. They used to just be a lumber yard, and now they they do it all uh, from start to finish. And I think that that's that's something you could, if you're ambitious, then you can certainly go go that way and uh, do it all from start to finish. But in terms of your skill set, it sounds like your skill set's really in the um, uh, overseeing everything uh, and not so much. I don't see you as a day-to-day kind of person answering the calls. So I, I would just let you know, and maybe Brandon and David could speak this more clearly that I suspect that the future, what, you're going to hit critical mass where there's going to be so many tenant issues that you're going to be very frustrated pretty soon if you don't have that outsourced. I mean, you could yeah. build yeah, it, it in house, like, but yeah, but you can outsource yeah. it way better. Yeah. And you have to decide. So uh, early on in my career, I actually worked for some real estate developers uh, before the 2007 crash. And um, there's a lot of ways to make money in real estate, right? Uh, and you all use the, the bird method, but um, certainly you can make money by remodeling. You can make money by renting. You can make money you know, refinancing. There's all these different ways to make money, but the market does go up and down. I mean, there are things yeah. that happen. And the great thing about real estate is you can make money in the up market. You can make money in the down market. You can make money in the flat market. You can make money on all the different markets. But if you are so busy in the day to day of answering tenant phone calls or remodels, or whatever, then you're not going to be able to, to see those opportunities and you're not going to be able to really cash in when you see a great deal. And so I'd, I'd rather see an entrepreneur's time and, and free space and energy and, and mind be open to that. And the things that are simple, like, um, like the last flipper I worked with, um, he just got uh, three partners in three cities who were the remodeling contractors and they did the remodeling because he wasn't a, re- a guy doing the remodeling and that simplified the remodels so that he could just focus in on, you know, the deals. And then he systemized how to, how to do the auctions. And then he had people go to the auctions for him. And so he just, he found the pieces um, that allowed him to, again, have the freedom and the bandwidth to continue to look for opportunities and look for those deals because, um, that's a better use of your time. You, I think you, you, if you want to make the most money for your time, that's where it is, not in the day-to-day repeatable tasks. Those things are going to be um, done by other people. And I, I would, for some people, I, I always recommend, you know, I recommend getting like a, a virtual assistant first or somebody who is very inexpensive to kind of manage uh, your lifestyle. But sometimes that can slow you down. And sometimes it's easier just to take a whole mechanical piece of your business like property management or remodeling or maybe having a realtor who you just always call and they, they, they're the ones to list all your properties. Um, that, that might be a better approach in terms of building a system for your business. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate the advice. Thanks, yeah. Josh. Appreciate right. the advice. Thanks, Josh. Well, thank appreciate you, Matthew. The advice. Appreciate it. Thanks, and thank you, uh, everyone advice. else who joined us Josh. today. Appreciate I guess the uh, advice. Thanks, Josh. that kind of brings us to the, the end of today's Thanks, show. Josh, Josh anything you want to follow Thanks, up with? Uh, maybe advice. final words of wisdom or advice or anything, Sam, you want to jump in with at all? I'll, I'll go first and I'll let Sam close it all out there. But I, I just want to say that um, real estate is a great business. I just want to say that to, to start off. There's a lot of companies I work with, you know, whether they have um, online, offline, traditional, virtual, around the world. But real estate is just a great business to be a master in because um, it's not going away. 
It's not going to be yep. outsourced. You can't send it off to China. Like it, it's going to be here and people need to live. And uh, so studying it like you all teach, I think is a really smart investment. And then um, realize that with everything, there's a system that can be done. And so whether, again, it's mobile home parks or it's remodels or it's small or big, whatever it is, um, realize that there's a system for doing it and uh, take the time to invest in your systems instead of just freewheeling it. I've worked with a lot of real estate companies that, that the owner just is always by the seat of his pants and 10 years later, they're still in a nightmare, right? Yeah. And you just don't want to do that. You want to be strategic about it. So think about it in terms of systems, write your strategic objective. Like what exactly are your goals? I think Matthew did a really good job of clarifying what his goals are. And then make sure that you stick to it, you know, stick to it, stick to your plan and be consistent and, and you'll, you'll get there. I love it, man. Hey, just let add one, one more piece to that. And then I'm going to jump in uh, with the famous four for Sam and for you, Josh. But uh, I was going to say one thing great about real estate investing is that this is not a brand new business. It's not unique. It's, it's been done by millions and millions of people, which is why, like, if you're like every problem we could ever have, like how to deal with this tenant issue or this land title issue, everything's been figured out by millions of people before. And so it, as long as people are open to the idea of asking, like, well, how do you deal with that? Or what's your system look like? What do you have a book on that? Like things like that. Like it's not, anyway, that's one thing I love about real estate is just that it's, it's already been so tested and tried. This is nothing new. So yeah, it's exciting. All right, guys. Well, we got to close up shop here in just a moment. Uh, but before we get out of here, I thought we'd hit our world famous. Famous four. The famous four is a part of the show where we ask the same four questions to every guest every week. So we're going to throw the first one at, uh, at you, Sam. Uh, I'll start with you. And then Josh, if you have a different answer, you probably do. But uh, is there a personal habit or trait you're trying to work on in your life right now? Anything you're trying to improve? Oh, man, everything can be improved. Uh, I have a little root routine that I do is 30, day, 30 days, 30 minutes of cleanup every day. So I wish you mm. could see the rest of my desk within the last 24 <laughs> hours. Take 30, 30 minutes a day to just straighten something out. And it might be online. It might be like a desk. It might be something you need to clean the car. Take 30 minutes yep. every day to clean things up. I, and I, I, take I, need 30. To, I need to do a better job of that uh, right now. All right. Josh, what about you? Anything uh, you're working on? Yeah, a workout routine. Uh, I just moved to Kauai a few months ago, and I had a my wife had oh, a nice. baby two weeks ago, and so our life is Congrats. in disarray. And so um, exercise has fallen down the priority scale to sleep, and so that's the one I want to nail again. I had it working well in Arizona, not so well in Hawaii. So th- that's that's the one. It's a, it, and the reason why is if your body and mind is not functioning properly, everything else gets off track, and so you really yeah. got to start there. And that's so true. All right. All right. What about your favorite business books? Other than your own, of course. Well, uh, the E Myth, of course, is what where I started, uh, and um, it did give a very philosophical, uh, a very phys- philosophical slant to what became the work, the system. The Eight Hour Work Week by uh, Tim Ferriss is terrific. Uh, it's an old book now, but I think he's revised it like a thousand times. Uh, but I, uh, the four, four, uh, four, four hour, you doubled this time. <laughs> did I? Okay. It's a four hour work week, right? right. I haven't read it in a long time. Uh, and there's some others, but, uh, and then work the system. <laughs> I reckon. There you go. Uh, it's Vol- uh, uh, the fourth edition though. Not the first, not, no, not the first no. edition though. That's what you no. say. <laughs> no. There you go. Looking forward to reading yeah. the fourth edition. And your new book. You have a new one coming out, right? Yeah. Uh, Josh doesn't even know this, uh, but it's mm. called One Layer Deeper, and I'm working on that. And that has to do with awesome. the thread that goes through Work the System is that you need, you know, in in this book, and I recommend a hard copy book all, always, although online's fine, but uh, on uh, the at the end of the preface, I list 12 very important points. And number one is reality is what it is, whether you like it or not. Uh, and then spend the majority of your work time in preparation and building, not personally executing your work. That's number four. Uh, create value for others all the time, and and so those are the, those are the things that uh, I circle around all day long. All right, I love it, Josh. Yeah, in terms business of business books. Uh, yeah, I typically read books for a specific purpose in mind. Right, I'm writing I'm reading a book right now about writing, and I wouldn't recommend it because it, 
it's not fun, but it's exactly what yeah. I need. <laughs> but obviously work the system. Uh, when I'm thinking about advertising and marketing, I think of Influence by Caldini. Uh, yeah, that's really great. good. I was just looking back. For anyone who's a consultant or coach, this one is really good. The business of expertise, but probably probably no one in your audience is. Um, hey, Emma. But um, with my kids, my favorite book is uh, Pilgrim's Progress. So I just kind of depends on the there audience and what I'm actually trying to uh, learn. And uh, try to consume them, and then put them behind me, and then reference them later. But um, it's, yeah. Anyways, investing in books cool. is a really smart, smart move. Awesome, man. All right. What about some of your hobbies? Uh, so <laughs> I'm a climber and a cyclist, and and Josh is right about the exercise thing. I've been a, an athlete all my life, uh, but I read a lot and read a whole variety of things. John, I put a pile of books here because that question always comes up. Steinbeck. Uh, yeah. Hemingway, you know, the classics, but some of the newer ones too, uh, uh, irresistible revolution. Um, one of my habits is to read every day. And if you read a book called the shallows, uh, and this fellow wrote another book called the glass cage, you find that reading is therapeutic and it doesn't matter what yeah. you're reading. Really. Uh, you read for knowledge and everything. Here's another one, uh, English. And then, um, this one, this Steinbeck book, Working Days, uh, is, is about writing, writing. And so if you read and you write, your mind kind of gets more linear. And if you don't yeah. read, and a lot of people don't read anymore, we're fooling with these devices all the time. Uh, but if you read a book, a hard, co- hard copy book, uh, that's the best thing you can possibly do. That's one of my yeah, favorite cool. habits. And then we like to travel. I love running my hounds in the dog <laughs> with the dogs yeah, in, that's uh, cool. out in the woods. Yeah. Josh, what, are you, what about you? What do you do? Uh, hobbies. You have kids. Yeah. You don't do anything. Yeah. And, yeah. I was going to say that that's pretty much it. No. So since we just moved up, we're going to the ocean every day is kind of our, kind of our thing. So boogie boarding, I haven't started surfing yet, but that's going to be soon. So I'm in going snorkeling, just, just trying to enjoy the time with my kids. And, uh, since I work at home and we homeschool that that's a big part of what we, we do for enjoyment, you know, learning, try to make learning fun and try to make it uh, a family affair. So in terms of other things right now, in this season of my life, there's not a whole lot of other <laughs> things to squeak out. All right. Last question for me. If you guys had to really boil it down into like a one sentence, what, separates successful people from those who give up, fail, or just never get started? I love it. (laughs) It's number one in my 12 here. Uh, Reality is what it is, whether you like it or not. And if you're not dealing with reality, you're dealing with this wish list over here, you're going to fail. And the people who are successful deal with reality, whether they like it or not. And it's not doesn't work the other way around. That's my one liner. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Sam's got a lot of great. I mean, if those of you who have not read the book, there's so many great nuggets of wisdom in there. And one of the ones I like is this, this idea of a uh, gun to the head enlightenment, which is when, um, when you have to actually move, like when life circumstances force you to move, then you're going to be successful. And most people, they're just comfortable with the reality. And another way to put that in the positive would be uh, those who are hungry, like those who actually mm-hmm are hungry to reach a certain level are are going to get there. Those who are comfortable where they are, they are going to stay where they are. And I think that's why most entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs because they they're, they're okay with the reality and dreaming about the future is, is good enough. They don't actually have a need. Like if they are like, I need to make, I don't know, six figures, they'll figure out a way, or I need to make a half million dollars a year they'll figure out a way, but if they don't yeah. need to, they're, they're going to, um, just settle. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. Man. I say all the time, never waste pain. Pain is an incredible <laughs> motivator, right? Yeah. You don't yeah. want to chase yeah. it out. You don't want to seek out pain. I'm not a psycho, but when it comes your way, <laughs> make the most out of it. That's good. Actually, that's a good, uh, aphorism. Yeah, that's good. All right. Last question of the day to each of you, where can people find out more about you? Well, work the system.com, uh, is the place to go. And there's a lot of really good information there. Uh, you can order the book there through Amazon. You can check out what Josh is doing. There's some pieces about me in there. And uh, I'm always available. Uh, Sam C. 
at workthesystem.com. Anybody can email me if they feel like it. Uh, and I like corresponding with people. Uh, but I, I would start at the book, uh, start at the website, consider getting the book, and uh, go from there. I pretty, that, does that cover it, Josh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's where we're at. Worksystem.com. Love to see you there. And, um, you know, the book is foundational. That's where everything starts. And if you want more help, that's that's what I'm involved in is trying to help you, whether that's coaching, consulting, on-site, uh, you name it. But uh, love to see you there if you if you want help in taking your business to that next level where it's a uh, self-managing business. I love it, man. All right. Well, thank Good. you guys so much. Really appreciate both of you. This has been a phenomenal episode and hope everyone goes and checks out the book and uh, everything else you guys put out there. So thank you. Thank you, David. Brandon. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Great to meet you, you too. <laughs> thanks, guys. And thanks to Eric, thanks. our great producer. You're guys. great producer. Yeah. For putting this together. Yeah, Eric. Yeah. Eric's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, good job, Eric. Guys. All, All right, right, David, you want to get guys. us out of here? This is David Green for guys. Brandon Work That System Turner, signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.